got to understand the issues that would be dangerous to your daily living because they are all written in English. We took it upon ourselves to start translating some of these books into the vernacular so that the common man out there should be able to understand some of the issues raised that would affect their daily lives. We think that um, even in the area of creativity, where in pain we believe in setting no limits and bounds, there should be no limits because you are restricted to the language that you know. If we were able to write in our mother tongues, we should have reached quite a number of people more than we have reached until today. I'm aware that things like the declarations that I've just seen, I have read, the Girona Manifesto, the Quebec declarations, if they were all translated in the languages that the people understand, they would have already thrown this room to learn what is it that we are doing to reach them more. With those few remarks, may I hand over uh, the mantle to come to continue. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do I need this? Yes. yes. Okay. For the translation. For the translation, of course. Bonjour, hello, Dumelang, Moweni. I um, am unfortunately going to speak in English, and uh, I hope you're going to. Um, Bear with me through my presentation, which hasn't arrived yet. I do speak a lot. Um, I'm a practitioner. I'm the um, director of PRICER. PRICER is the project for the study of alternative education in South Africa. We've been around since 1992. Some of you will remember Neville Alexander, who was the director and founder of PRICER. Um, I'm going to take you through some of our history because I think it tells a story that needs to be heard on in Africa and beyond. Um, in a way, there should be nothing more to be said. We, we are still trying to persuade people that mother tongue education, education in African languages is appropriate for African language speaking children. And we shouldn't be needing to argue this anymore, but sadly we are. So um, the kind of work that we've been able to do in South Africa and to a certain extent beyond in other parts of the continent um, is such a struggle. I think everybody knows that. But we do manage and we will push on. I just want to say before I start with my presentation, as I can't, that I do have a suggestion for, and I won't be here this afternoon, I, I feel like it is really urgent that we get a story collection together for children in diverse countries and communities in the world where the story collection speaks to the issues that we all deal with around diversity, identity, um, culture, and that we find ways to use stories to help children to share to share ideas and concepts about their identities and who they are, to help promote empathy, um, to, to help promote individual strength where it's needed. We haven't got that, and I think that in the North and the South we share that, that challenge hugely, and, and um, I just want to put that in there. Um, because I'm not going to be here to, to, to make a, a suggestion, but I will write it down for you. Um, yeah. Am I going to be able to use my presentation? It was shown. Yeah, it was. Um, is it there? Good. Okay. What I did with this. Okay. All right. So we share similar challenges across Africa, and I hope that you 
um, are happy for me to talk about the beginnings of all of this because that's where I work. I work with, with childhood and I work with children's development and I think that if, until we get children reading and writing and excited, we're going to um, have these struggles later on. So it begins with young children. We have these similar challenges across the continent. Since 1992, PRISA has been promoting multilingualism, the use of African languages. We've been trying to grow reading and writing habits, creating storybooks and print-rich environments, and supporting multilingual education in schools. Um, you know, we have severe challenges in South Africa still. Um, you know, figures, give or take, percentages are, are, are accurate or not, but we do know that only about 5% of parents uh, read to children, read stories with children. Not only parents, caregivers, teachers, librarians. Adults do not read with children widely in our country, and I know that we share that um, across the continent. Children also have very poor um, teaching and learning opportunities, and in fact they go through what my colleague in Austria, Brigitte Bush, called a language shock, because they have to leave their language that they have learnt everything in at home. They leave it behind as they enter the schoolroom. And for many of us, when we think about liter literacy, we think about English or French or Portuguese. Literacy is equated with an ex-colonial language. So, it's a bit similar with the concept of mother tongue. We talk about mother tongue education, and so many of my colleagues in South Africa think mother tongue education means African language education. And I always have to say, I'm a mother tongue speaker, that's why I know about the importance of the mother tongue. You know, we all have a mother tongue, however we want to define that, or many mother tongues. In terms of our literacy teaching in school, we have this um, part to whole approach, skills based approach, where children are taught the small bits first. We think we have to be little linguists before we can appreciate the power and the joy of reading. So we teach them ma me mi ma mu, sa se si sa su. And for many of our children, that is not enough because they don't have the rich world of stories or people sharing what the power of reading and writing is with them. So it's very difficult for them to, to, to make meaning out of what it is they're doing. And that can also be the case in an African language, because it's not just about using a language that you understand. It's about the teaching methods that are used to teach you how to become a reader and a writer. I'm going to talk about quite a lot in this session. I want you to please feel free to just stop me and, and, and challenge me or ask a question or tell me a um, comment um, because this should be a dialogue. It shouldn't just me, be me talking at you. And I will probably skip over some sections because we don't have that much time. So, Price's work since 1992, we worked on the language policy in education. That still is the policy document for education in South Africa today. That was in 1997. And some of you will know it is probably the most progressive language policy document around. Um, it promotes mother tongue based bilingual education for all children. But the sad reality is that the only children who enjoy all the advantages of mother tongue based education, from the cradle to the university, are English speakers and some of the can speakers, not all of the can speakers. And I, I want to share this quote with you from an ex-colleague of mine, Kathleen Hugh, because it is an indictment on where we are today. She said, through research that she did, she says, though the curriculum was bad under apartheid, 
eight years of mother tongue instruction, which was what children had in the past, gave pupils the time to learn their own language through this language and to learn a second language and a third language sufficiently well to make the switch in medium in the ninth year. During the first phase of Bantu education, 1953 to 76, the matriculation results improved despite the poor <coughs> curriculum. And her claim is that that was because the language, the African languages were used for eight years and the switch to English only took place in the ninth year. So children were being taught English for much longer and they were using a language they understood well to develop concepts and then to learn to read and write. So this idea of mother tongue based bilingualism that has been in our policy since 1997 is saying it's not a matter of either the mother tongue or the English, it's a matter of both mother tongue and English because English acts as the lingua franca and the language of power as we know um, globally still. So a lot of people disagree with this and in South Africa we've had more than 20 years of discussions which quite frankly are very tiresome because we really, as I said already, should be beyond having to argue about this. People feel that if their children have to get to know English soon, they must start learning in English from the beginning. And we have this idea that our brains are something like a, a jug, and if you fill it up with African language, there's no space for English. <laughs> and this happens widely across our society. It's not just um, uh, teachers or educationists, it's parents, it's all of us. We've all imbibed this myth that in order to learn English, you have to learn through English. Um, in fact, we know from research that to learn a foreign language or an additional language, you need role models who are good speakers of the language, you need environments that are literate and are very, very supportive. You need a lot of appropriate resources. And we do not have that in South Africa. Um, so even for that reason, if you don't even think about identity and democracy, which we do think about, even if you just think about um, the practical reasons in the country, the only answer to the education, um, to educational success for all children is a mother tongue based bilingual um, situation. There are, I don't need to convince you about that, so I'm going to just skip right over there. We did a drawing um, taking Jim Cummins' um, work on showing um, how our brains work with language, so we, we made our own way to try and help our teachers and everybody understand that we don't have to see our languages as separate, that we can see concepts moving across, we can see language learning happening between languages, and that in fact to use a language a child brings to the school is to use their greatest strength. That's the European analogy. We don't have icebergs here, so, so it doesn't work so well for us. But, you know, just to make the point, what we see on the top is, is, is very little. It's that common world of concepts underneath that is really, really important. Uh, and I think, and maybe colleagues here can tell me if I'm right or wrong, there, there is nowhere where there is any official provision made for mother tongue education beyond the third or fourth year in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And this has been the same story for, for years and years. I mean, I'm getting old now, and uh, <laughs> we've, been, um, we've been in this issue, and it is a matter of political will. Sadly, our governments are not uh, supportive. They might say they're supportive, it might be in the Constitution, but when it comes down to it, it doesn't happen. Now in South Africa, I don't know how much of you know about our political situation at the moment, and I certainly can't go into it, I'm not an authority either. But um, Neville Alexander asked some years ago, this is him talking, um, the big issue now in South Africa, um, is it likely that the explicit and implicit language planning from above and uh, from by government and from below, this was in 2006, I think, by NGOs, will help to bring up 
bring about the non-racial unity promised in the new constitution, which is the challenge for South Africa and has been, as you all know, the metaphor of the rainbow was widely used in the years following the fall of the party. Now he then went on to say the relapse into racial identities that has taken place because of the implementation of affirmative action and black empowerment measures in both public and the private sectors has caused the main debates on individual and collective identities to center on race rather than on language. Neville wrote that in 2006, which is more than 10 years ago. We are now reaping. And we're going to reap what our government perpetuated through insisting on an affirmative action system carried out through the racial categorization that we had, had inflicted on us through apartheid. So I just want to make that point because, you, you know, this is where we're at at the moment in South Africa. We're at a very, very serious point where a lot of um, trouble is starting to happen and where youth are very angry, understandably very angry, but where the, the, the narrative is framed completely in race terms now. There's no class analysis or very little class analysis and language is still um, struggling. So now I'm going to rather talk about something more hopeful for a while, which is the work that we've been doing over many years. And uh, that's a picture of Neville, some of you will recognize him with me many, many years ago, looking very hopeful. <laughs> we work for our children, for the children of the future. And from our perspective, it starts with mutual curiosity, respect, trust. <coughs> and our, our claim and our belief is that any setting can become fertile for literacy. Because we are all meaning makers, we are all storytellers, and uh, language is what we do as human beings, and written language is also part of language. And ch all children have the capacity to become literate and biliterate. Our system is what fails them. Our education system and our society fails them. It is not what is happening in children's heads, and nor is it even poverty per se. Even very poor children can become literate. All of these things underpin what we do. The, the concept of play, that play is story in action, that we need adults to be social and cultural role, role models. It's not that we need them to be, they are. They are, no matter what, what we do, we are the role models for our children. And that the invisible knowledge and learning that happens at home, where, whatever the knowledge is at home, gets, um, imbibed by children. So if when you're in a home you have a lot of reading and writing valued in your environment and adults who share that with you in your language, you will value reading and writing and you'll want to do it for yourself because literacy develops as a social and cultural practice. It is not a set of skills only that we give to people and then empower them. And that is the big, big problem in our context in Africa, that we see literacy as teaching skills to people and then we're going to use it. Now, the one, those of us who rise into the elite who do read and write are the minority. The vast majority of people are not able to experience this social and cultural uh, practice. So the mm -hmm. kind of projects that we've done over many years have been to try and bring raise the status of African languages. First in school, and I'm going to go through this quite quickly, first in schools, many years ago we started a project where we brought um, a Kosa speaking teacher together with an English speaking teacher and we taught the children simultaneously in Kosa and in English how to read and write. Um, and these are just some examples of the kind of writing they did they started, and this is at the heart of what we do, we say children must use whatever they know about language, written language, at the same time as they are learning. We don't wait for them to learn lists of words and sounds and sentences before they start feeling the power of writing. So these are just some early examples to show you that we need children to embed what they do, and that's in uh, Kosa, 
So, so the, that the literacy in one language is developing and supporting literacy in the other language at the same time. This can be done in any setting. It doesn't even have to be a school. If adults start writing with children, children will write back and you can create the print in any language. Then we started a project on um, reading for enjoyment in schools. And I'm being a bit facetious here. I said the children loved the stories, surprise, surprise, but the adults disappeared because they were too busy. And this is what we found, this is what we still find, and this is why um, we now run um, Nadi Bali, which is a reading for enjoyment campaign. I'll get you in a minute. Am I going too fast? Is it all right? So we've also developed courses which are online, and I thought I'd share this with you in case people are interested. This is on how to teach early literacy in multilingual settings. It's been there for a long time. It's still valid, still useful, um, and I can share those kind of links with you. Um, we did training for multilingual education in Africa um, for many years, and that's just to show you how Al Matenje, did anybody know El Matenje from Malawi? He was, okay. Anyway, there have been a whole lot of initiatives during the 2000s to try and excite the, the reality of, of, of multilingual education in South Africa and in other African countries. Um, and of course, in order to do that, hand in hand, have had to go the development of multilingual materials. Those were a few, uh, some few that we began with. Um, and in the doing comes the developing. And the, as some of my colleagues had a project which they called the intellectualization of the African languages, and that was an African Union um, project for many years. So in order to intellectualize and develop languages, you have to use them in the high status um, functions. I brought some of our things, our books with, but um, basically over several years we have struggled to convince publishers that they need to publish um, storybooks in African languages for children. Um, publishers are only prepared to do that if you pay them to do that. And we understand the cycle. It's an economic imperative. And the real challenge in Africa, I think, um, remains that the textbook industry is what makes money for the publishers. And because so many writers and even illustrators and people earn their living through textbooks, there is a sort of a relegation of, of story to the edges. And story stories are seen as supplementary. We call them supplementary materials. So our children's literature is still incipient in Africa because it's that almost plaiting together of understanding how children learn to read and write and the value of children's literature literature and the textbooks take over and the literature never comes and so children don't get that rich language and so we land up with our results which are appalling um, this is just more materials I had this story I was going to share with you but I won't because of time it's just a very beautiful little story that, that is in all 11 <coughs> languages by the way it's about this little cat who wants to go to school, but his mother drinks. <laughs> and so when he gets to school, the teacher says to him, your turn to read, and he says, but I can't read. And he's really embarrassed and really sad and unhappy. And then, uh, so he's upset and he goes home and he, and, and, he, and he washes himself and he tries to become clean and he wants to learn so badly. This is a story from, um, somebody in a, a workshop who had this experience as a child and he turned it into a story. And um, he, he lands up with the, the children who are these other animals who say, um, don't worry, we'll help you. And, um, and, and so he 
kind of comes to find this sort of a new home because he, well, he first goes back to his mother and she's drunk. And then the chicky, big chicky takes him home and says, I'll, I'll look after you. And it's, it's a really beautiful story also because it's about, it doesn't have to be a cat who can look after you, a chicken can also look after you. So I, we, you know, we really like that story. Um, um, on the Pricer website, for those of you who are interested, there is an archive of material from the work that has been done over the years, or the, the research and development work on multilingual education. So I just tell you that for your interest in case you want to get hold of any of it. My colleague here remembers that we did a project uh, in 2004 called Stories Across Africa. And that was before digitalization. Um, we got funding from Ford Foundation for that. And it was this wonderful gift because they appreciated the, the need to develop stories in African languages. And we had a big project calling for stories in many languages. And sadly, because their priorities changed before we got far enough, and because of all the difficulties that we all know, the challenges of publishing across the continent, certainly then and possibly the same now, um, we only managed to produce this set of Little Hands books for the very youngest children. And we did it in 23 languages, which was quite a feat in any case, but um, it didn't go nearly as far as it should have. I think now there's much more potential for that because of the digital space. And I hope that this afternoon you do talk about some kind of collaboration around that. Um, but you can see our little hands books have been widely used, not as widely used as they should have. Um, through the Little Hands Trust, and there you'll see Margie Orford, who is part of Penn, she, she's a, on our trust now. We spend a lot of time raising funds to develop books in African languages for children. And I, I wanted to just also show you these. You could look at them later. For, for babies, because, you know, African toddlers and babies are no different from European ones or ones who speak English. They also benefit from appropriate little books in their languages. I spent 20 years trying to persuade a publisher that we needed to make baby books in South African languages, and we've managed now. We've got 16 little books in all 11 languages. Now the next challenge is how you get them into the hands of the children, because that is also a challenge, as everybody knows. It really is a challenge. So, so um, we are, and I'll show you how, um, not enough, but we are. But it is these kind of experiences that get African children on the same road as English-speaking children. And until we find a way to do this, our, the majority of children are going to struggle to, um, to, to, to learn effectively. So the, this is just um, showing you some of with Penn, we've had a partnership for the last few years, and it's been wonderful because Penn has supported <coughs> the translation of, first of all, some um, stories into all 11 languages as part of a campaign that I'll show you. Um, <coughs> every little bit helps, as, as we all know. The, every time you get another story into an African language or into another African language from one language, you are going to reach that many more children, assuming you do reach them with another story. And that really is the, is the point. Our latest work with the support of Penn, um, and we're looking for more support because um, it's very expensive to print books, as you know, is that in South Africa, we're really struggling with science and mathematics, with children's learning. And so we decided to use a children's story that is about the universe and is about scientific concepts, 
um, also to support the translation of terminology for science into African languages to show people, to convince them through doing again in a non-threatening way, that it is possible to do the highest level of science and mathematics in an African language. The arguments are often very strong, that we don't have the terminology, so we can't do it. And, and, and so this project was um, done in, in Corsa and in Zulu. We've translated two books. Um, and now we, the challenge is to get them read and to get children excited about reading and to get adults excited about reading these stories. Um, we realized uh, in the middle of two, 2000s that working with schools alone would never get um, African languages literacies developed in South Africa. And we moved into a space uh, which was informal and community-based. And um, this quote from Neville Alexander is one which really comes to the heart of what we try to do. It just says, we taught one another what we knew, discovering each other's resourcefulness. We also learned how people with little or no formal education could not only themselves participate in education programs, but actually teach others a range of different insights and skills. The University of Robben Island was one of the best universities in the country. Now, the, the point for us was that we all need one another, and we cannot leave it to the experts or to the authorities or to the policy makers. We cannot, because nothing happens, or very little happens. So we started um, building community-based reading clubs. And um, this brings me to the last um, part of my story, which is really where we are at currently. Um, Nalibali means here's the story in Kosa. Here's the story. And it's a Reading for Enjoyment campaign. Now, we have managed to get the support from a South African uh, trust. Not, not enough support, but the support to run a fairly large-scale campaign, to develop it and to run it. And I really hope that this will have knock-on effects into other parts of Africa, because we are learning things now through this campaign that we can share with others. Everybody knows Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, but so, you know, the thing is that what we do at school, through mother tongue, um, not mother tongue, through foreign language education and through poor teaching, is we shut down <coughs> children's imagination. And so, we want to inspire people, and Nalibadi is really all about trying to inspire adults to become the role models they need to be for children. We have uh, programs of training, mentoring, for setting up and running reading clubs, or just for reading with your own children, wherever you are. We have a, a, a significant advocacy and media campaign. This is the part that really takes the funds, and it is really helpful. I don't think it's essential, but it obviously is really helpful, and you'll see why. And then we also are producing multilingual content. We want people, no matter where they are in the most rural part of South Africa, to have enough in their hands to not be able to say, I've got nothing to read to the children. To, to be able to say, here is what you need, and this means that you don't have an excuse this week to not read a story with the, with the children. Um, messaging. As a campaign, we've thought through very carefully the kind of messages that would hopefully help adults to see that their role is so important. It doesn't matter. Even if they can't read and write themselves, they can tell stories. So Nalibali is about reviving the storytelling tradition as well as making a bridge to, um, to literacy. So read to me, it's never too early and it's never too late. It doesn't matter if you've never, never had a story read to you, start now. And that it's, the paralysis must stop and every day counts. Read to me, explore a story. Um, it's not just about getting children to practice reading. 
It's about engaging with them about the ideas in the story. And that's one of the most valuable things to get children wanting to read for themselves. And then the again, again, it's that ne not once a month, it's every day, it's regular. Uh, it's in my language, it's book by book. One of the most profound things that I've realized through this campaign, and it's so simple, is that each and every one of us becomes literate, text by text. And if we don't start to grow that internal library in our minds, we don't have anything to share with children. So many ad adults are paralyzed because they, they don't have much to share. So it's about polishing up what you have and then growing it. Um, I know this sounds very simple to my colleagues um, from the North because where literacy is so embedded, it, it's happening, but I think in minority languages, maybe it doesn't happen as much. We use, um, we use digital um, a lot. We have apps for, for mobile and for simple phones and smartphones. There's a collection of stories now in all 11 languages that people can access. We have a great website, and it might be interesting for you to look at. I can share it with you. One of the wonderful things is that we have um, managed to get the South African Broadcasting Company to broadcast stories in all 11 languages three times a week to children across South Africa. That's huge, because most people know Nalibali through the stories they hear um, on the radio. And those stories are open source. We've collected them, we've turned them into stories that can be used. They're a starting point. They're not necessarily the greatest stories. They're not necessarily all the stories that we want, but there are now hundreds of stories where before there were. And if any colleagues from outside of South Africa want to share those stories, you can have them and do what you want with them. Um, they're meant to travel now. Um, these are, this is a newspaper supplement that we produce, um, which has the story material in every week for adults. And it's bilingual always, so it's in English and Kosa or English and Zulu, um, Afrikaans English, Sutu English. We only stopped by money, as we all know. We, we can do this if we have the kind of support and we share the expertise. We have colleagues who know how to do this work. Um, and I'll just share a few examples of what we do. It's fantastic. You see children and adults just really, really engaging. Um, and what we've managed to reach a point in the country where everybody is keen on reading now. Everybody wants to do it. That doesn't mean that, uh, that what we do is completely successful at all. It certainly isn't. But in our minds, we all do appreciate that um, reading for enjoyment and personal satisfaction is important. Um, in our training courses, we go right down to the very, very beginnings of, we don't assume anything, because even our teachers say to us, but we don't know how to read aloud to children. We don't know how to choose stories for children. Um, and so we just get down, we like it in a preschool, we do it. Everything we do, we sing, we play, we, 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 we do it together with adults. And teachers and librarians actually have fun. There's the Department of Education being trained by us. Um, we're doing a lot of training with teachers, and it's very ironic that teachers are saying to us, ah, we understand now, you know, and they've been through their training. Um, I'm going to pass over that. Um, reading and writing, inspiring children, using African languages, using English. The, the reading clubs are in both languages. Um, most adults want to teach children English, and we need to keep on and on with the message. English is okay, but also use African languages. Use your mother tongue. It's not enough to just go into English. That's a big struggle still in South Africa. 
um, a lot of events to make people excited, going to libraries, having, having um, outside events where you share stories with large numbers of, of people and going to communities, talking at, at bus stations. All of this is to try and bring the power of story home to people in their languages and in English. I don't think that's going to work. We got this big billboard campaign going where we were able to put up these fantastic billboards for a while. Story power, bring it home. You have all these decisions which you have to make about how to do, which languages to use when you're in a very multicultural area. And uh, so that everybody chose to do story power in English and then the tagline in an African language. Um, I actually didn't agree with that, but colleagues said then you would miss people in different African languages. So we grapple with all of these issues all the time, um, how to make sure that, that we keep African languages at the forefront of this um, reading for enjoyment process. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much for that detailed presentation. Um, going to throw, I think, uh, it's now for us to ask questions if we have any make comments. And um, I'm any, standing up because because you okay because I prefer standing. Are we going to get um, another mic, or are we going to be sharing the same between me and the speaker? Um, <laughs> Nothing again, I see. <laughs> it's your privilege. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I think it's time for discussion, and we shall invite the stories from. Uh, yeah. Okay, fine. We we'll start from there. Okay. Not because you're from Africa. But <laughs> 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 but you were the first to raise the hand up. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Carol. Um, your presentation is like a reservoir to me, and uh, very insightful, very resourceful. I want to write, but I actually don't know where to start, how to write, what I can write, because what... Uh, what uh, sorry, could you please start by uh, introducing yourself so that we know uh, who you are in time for? Okay. Um, I'm Ali Kamara from Penn Sierra Leone. Yes, and uh, this presentation is just too wonderful for me because at Penn Sierra Leone, uh, we just started developing books, children books, and for schools. So it's like, it's so important to me, I'm trying to write, but uh, really, I, I, it's like, uh, I, I can't write everything you are now, I mean, I mean discussing with us. So um, I want to, first of all, appeal here through Pay International, uh, that uh, you make it possible for us to have, I mean, your PowerPoint presentation to our various centers. That will help us a lot, as we cannot put everything on paper as we are talking now. And um, we are also facing some of the problems you highlighted here, especially in the area of publishing. We, uh, of course, is familiar and know because of the commercial values. Um, most of the time, writers uh, prefer writing textbooks than the supplementary, I mean, readers in the country. And there is equally the problem of uh, uh, prioritizing reading materials in schools. Um, children go mostly for textbooks in school because they need to pass their examinations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go around persuading them that, uh, yes, it's good to write, I mean to read, but you are just reading to pass examinations. Mm -hmm. It is also equally important that uh, you read for pleasure and you read so that uh, your horizon will be broadened and that uh, you have a lot of experiences in your reading and in the communicating, contributing to the um, uh, community in Africa and the world in general. So um, let me stop here and just ask you to uh, advise us as to how to overcome this problem of publishing, how to encourage um, um, maybe African government and uh, to encourage um, um, reading supplementary materials in schools, and what are the ways of improving you know, um, supplemental reading in schools, and uh, not just uh, textbooks. Thank you. And perhaps we, sh we can go around, we might find ourselves uh, people also sharing the same 
similar situations. So uh, let's see those who have something about the similar not to ask. So I think let, let's collect a few more. Let's um, There was a hand here. Um, well, I'll try to speak in English, even if my mother tongue is French. Uh, uh, first of all, I... What's your name? Uh, Alex Parodi, Switzerland. <laughs> Four official languages and the 26th mother tongue. Um, I, I was very interested, first of all, of your engagement.